This Real Egg Radio podcast is brought to you by high-performing carbine insecticide from FMC. Carbine insecticide delivers fast, selective, and extended control of aphids in alfalfa and pulses, leaving beneficials like lady beetles to help in the fight. Ask your retailer today. It's time for Real Egg Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Egg Radio and RealEggCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Egg Radio. Radio here on Rural Radio 147 at Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Friday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. Also, a big shout out to everybody listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast in Canada, the United States, or beyond North America. It is uh, great to have you with us here today. So it is Friday. It's a closure to the, the weekday portion of the week. And uh, we're going to wrap up and, and really kind of look at some of the biggest issues that uh, faced agriculture and uh, what to look to head to. Uh, of course, there is a lot happening. We've got, we're going to get an update what's happening with uh, the dairy industry in the U.S. as it relates to HPAI. Uh, we're going to talk about that as well as some job numbers out in Canada and the U.S. The Canada's job numbers not looking good. The U.S. much better. How does that change what we're going to see when it comes to interest rate decisions by central banks? in the months ahead. We're also going to talk about a recent survey, and we talked about this earlier on in the week on Real Ag Radio, I believe it was on Wednesday, farmers' opinions on how trade negatively or positively impacts their farming operations, some very, very interesting findings, and uh, oh, i got a whole lot more too. There's there's lots to chat about here. Our, our guests, our panelists are going to be Megan Murdoch of Hill and Knowlton out of Toronto will be with us. As, as well as Kelvin Hepner, of course, of Real Agriculture. If you have any feedback, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. We're going to get to it. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back with the Real Ag Issues panel right after this. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. CDC Endure is a new oat line from Alliance Seed. High yielding with excellent disease resistance and the quality end users ask for all in one great oat variety. CDC Endure provides the high beta-glucan levels to make heart healthy products like breakfast cereals. For more information on CDC Endure oats as well as any other products from Alliance Seed, check out allianceseed.com or visit any Alliance Seed authorized retailers. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Friday. It's now time for the Real Ag Issues panel. But first, I want to tell you about Co-op. Co-op knows your community because we live here too. Our teams are your trusted partners with a range of expertise to help support your entire farm operation. Co-op, here for your farm, here for your family. Learn more by going to Co-op's website, co-op.crs slash farm. Let's dig in with, well, first we've got to introduce our panelists. I guess we should start there. Uh, up first is Kelvin Hepner coming out of Altona, Manitoba. Kelvin, how are you doing? Doing well, Sean, although today I'm not uh, in the Altona area. I'm actually in uh, the good province of Saskatchewan in right. Regina. You're in Regina? Whoa, whoa, what are you doing there? What's happening? We're uh, we're trying this spring hockey thing for the first time this year, and uh, the girls have a tournament uh, oh. starting today uh, here UK. at uh, the Cooperator Center. I caved, yeah. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. There's 
there's a bunch of uh farm dads uh on the team as well or a bunch of the dads are also farmers so uh it's been uh we're all a little bit maybe feeling anxious that maybe we should be at home getting seating equipment ready because of how quickly it's turning to uh, to spring around here but uh yeah it's been a lot of fun so far uh time's your friend you'll, you'll be okay Th- those are some of the most uh, those are fun weekends because it's uh it's all tur- tournament oriented and it's a it's a, it's a it's a good time also joining us is megan murdoch from h and k strategies or i should say hill hill and knowlton i've got to get this new i gotta get the rebrand correct based out of toronto ontario <laughs> megan how are you doing I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for getting the brand right there. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't need a brand officer sending me an email. <laughs> I've had those before, so yeah. So we'll we'll uh we'll get we'll get it correct. Uh, how was your week? What were you doing? It, it was good, but I uh, I thought of you because you know baseball season has started here, um, but it it really wasn't baseball season weather. It was not the kind of weather you, where you would want the dome open. Uh, we had it rained, snow, everything in between this week. So I am hoping it clears up soon and we can get that dome open. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what those renos look like. I've seen like, some, they've, they've sort of slow released what it's going to look like. It It is going to be amazing. Those seats are right on top of the field, just like it is at City Field in New York for the Mets. And they've, one of the things that people probably don't know is that the old Sky Dome Rogers Center, what they had, it was supposed to be a, multi-purpose facility so all the seats pointed to the middle of the of the floor now what they've done is it's a true baseball park all of the seats point towards home plate that's going to be a major difference because if you've ever sat like say in deep left field deep right field down the line you were always sitting in your seat and then watching the game with your side your head to the side so it's going to be really cool uh looking forward to uh seeing it so sooner than later Okay, uh, jobs numbers, Kelvin. Uh, I, I'm, we're going to get to the U.S. and the Canada numbers, but let's, we'll put it very simply. The U.S. numbers look a lot better than the Canadian numbers. Let's focus on Canada. What, what do we see for job growth in March? Well, Canada's unemployment rate jumped to 6.1% in March. Uh, that's up from 5.8% the previous month in February, and uh, it's also the largest increase we've seen in the unemployment rate now going back uh, over, well, nearly two years. And so this is, I think, I I know we have to take this all with a grain of salt. We always say that when the numbers go the other way, that, well, it's month to month. These numbers, we have to look at the general trend, not the month to month 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 numbers. But I think in many ways, this is uh, some signs of things coming home to roost here with the economy shedding. Uh, It was was a modest number, just over 2,000 jobs uh, in terms of uh, decrease, but of course, with immigration and in- increasing number of people in in the country, the unemployment rate uh, is now up one percentage point on a year over year basis. And it's young people in particular that are feeling the, the chill in the labor market employment among those under 24 and under declined by 28,000. The jobless rate for that group rose to 12.6%. Per- uh, 12.6%. That's the highest it's been since September 2016, outside of the pandemic. Uh, and then uh, if you look at the sectors where uh, job losses happened, a lot of them were in accommodation and food services, wholesale, retail trade. Um, meanwhile, employment increased in four industries led by healthcare and social assistance. And if you look at the breakdown of public versus private sector uh, stats here from StatsCan, uh, employment in, uh, in the public sector in Canada, the number of employees is up nearly 5% year over year. Uh, the number of employees in the private sector in Canada is up just over 1% year over year. So, And the number of self-employed people is down uh, 0.7% in the last year. So uh, mm-hmm. that kind of is a, a snapshot of uh, of where things are at and, and I think some general trends that we've been seeing for a while. Megan, I'm down in the U.S. this week at a high school baseball tournament and I'm standing behind the backstop last night at one of my son's game and college scout who's taking some video beside me and we started chatting he said you know i told him where i was from we're just chatting and he says oh canada i've I've been there before um i heard your economy really sucks right now what's going on and so we had this whole big conversation does our economy suck right now yeah it's it's a little turbulent perhaps um but you're right in that if we were to compare to our neighbors to the south it does feel like their economy is a bit stronger at the moment um, what I thought was interesting, you know, these job numbers uh, year over year, uh, as Kelvin said, you don't really want to compare month over month, but year over year, um, we have, you know, we have currently 1.3 million 
um, unemployed people in our country. And a year ago, that number was closer to, to 1 million, about 1.5 million. So we're up about 250,000 more people unemployed right now. And these are really key data points that, you know, not just uh, that that guy at the at the tournament is watching, but that the Bank of Canada is watching. Um, they're looking at these data points month over month to see if uh, the interest rate increases are taking the effect that they want um, and, and whether they can start to think about reducing that interest rate. Potentially June, I think a lot of folks are looking at uh, potentially July, but this jump from 5.8 to 6.1 um, certainly bodes well for uh, at least a, a slight cut in that interest rate sooner rather than later. Hey, I've been following along. A lot of the theory is you, you know, you 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 know you can stop raising rates when the unemployment starts to get across, you'll know, go up and go across a certain line. I, I don't know what exactly the threshold the Bank of Canada is using, but uh, definitely that is the the trend right now. In the U.S., em employers added a seasonally adjusted 303,000 jobs in March. Now the expectation was 200. The unemployment rate slipped; it went down actually to 3.8 percent versus February's 3.9 percent which was uh, in line with expectations, according to a story in the Wall Street Journal. So uh, I, I, we should rewind the tape here a little bit. I, I don't have the audio, but I do want to remind uh, my, my fellow panelists in the audience that last time we had some job numbers, I believe I said it's starting to look like Canada, although people were thinking they wouldn't lower rates until after the U.S., mm -hmm. it's starting to look like Canada may have to pump the brakes here before the U.S. does, because I heard a lot of economists this morning on Bloomberg Radio talking about how the U.S. may be in a one, maybe two interest rate cut situation here in 2024, and it's definitely in the back half of 24. Can Canada mm -hmm. wait that long, Kelvin? Well, if we keep seeing data like this, this would be a, a point in, on the side of, of uh, the board in terms of uh, of earlier rate rate cuts happening here in, in Canada, like you said, Sean, I, I do think that the Bank of Canada can't get too far ahead of uh, the Fed in terms of uh, its actions. It kind of has to move in coordination or there, I'm sure there will be, there is a lot of communication between the central banks. But uh, yeah, at, at this point, and like Megan said too, our economy right now relative to the US is uh, is definitely weaker. And, and so there are a bunch of reasons here why the Bank of Canada could could move before the the Fed does, and and like you said, Sean, that there there has been a fair bit of messaging again over the last week, coming from the Federal Reserve saying that, uh, and and Chairman Powell saying that uh, uh, they're going to need more data and and more info before they move towards cuts. They're they're looking at staying longer. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, this would be the this unemployment number is certainly a key figure in uh, in that algorithm or that formula that the Bank of Canada uses to make its decisions. So I. I do think that this tilts it towards uh, a rate cut sooner again. Well, and Megan, does does today's raising unemployment, does that help Minister Miller, who's been talking about how, hey, one of the problems here on housing is TFWs, and oh, by the way, now apparently we've already got too many people looking for work. We don't, we don't need more. These companies should be hiring Canadians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, we all know uh, politicians will use the facts that serve – uh, their policy initiatives and today's numbers certainly do serve his recent announcement um, to to not renew what uh, the department has called time limited expansion of the TFW program. Um, so, for instance, the uh, the Lima would have existed or would have been possible to use for 12 months. It will now be only useful for six months. Um, and instead of 30% of your workforce uh, being reliant on or in your company being reliant on TFWs, now only 20%. So these were moves that they made uh, during the pandemic, and they've they've announced uh, just two weeks ago or so they won't be renewing them, and that's as of May 1st. So not much of a runway, uh, not much time for agri-food companies to plan for these changes in the system. Um, and yeah, he didn't have this da data when he made the announcement. Um, so, you know, it's it's certainly something that feeds their policy initiatives and a lot of the discussion around housing. 
Um, and yeah, today's data will, will only help that. Well, I, I want to talk about maybe who's right and who's wrong on whether or not agriculture should be concerned about these TFW program changes. But we're going to take a break. Uh, this segment also I want to mention Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Also, Field Heroes and WGRF, the sponsors of our Pest and Predator podcast. Let's take a break. You're listening to Real Ag Radio, Rural Radio 147, Sirius X. FP Genetics relentlessly brings innovative new seed genetics to Canadian farms, ensuring growers, breeders, and farmers are supported and viable. Being a valued partner on your farm for decades, you can expect the continuous pursuit of the best genetics. Visit fpgenetics.ca to discover FP's strong portfolio of wheat, durum, barley, oats, peas, and rye, or contact your local FP seed dealer or territory manager to discuss your certified seed strategy specific to your region. Before you get back in the field this year, spend some time with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. Get all the information you need on hybrid selection, planting depth, crop inputs, and more from a wide range of industry experts. A massive library of video content is available on demand when you need it most. Spend your time outside of the field, inside the classroom with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. If you have a growing list of questions about getting more from your fields, know that Coke Agronomic Services has an answer for every acre. With a full spectrum of nutrient management, nutrient protection, and seed enhancement options, Coke Agronomic Services offers a deep portfolio of agronomically effective products. Each designed to enhance yield potential, all available to help solve your problems. Find the answer that's right for your acres. Start by visiting cokeag.ca. That's K-O-C-H ag.ca. Yeah, welcome back to Real Ag Radio here for the Real Ag Issues panel. This segment is brought to you by the pre-emergent soil active herbicides Valterra EZ and Fierce EZ from New Farm. Get ahead of hard to kill weeds, spray after spring, thaw for up to eight weeks of extended weed control this spring. Find out more about New Farm products at newfarm.ca. Sean Haney, Kelvin Hefter of Real Agriculture, also Megan Murdoch of Hill and Knowlton. We were just chatting about some of the relating the jobs numbers we saw this morning to some of the conversation happening with uh, temporary foreign workers and the Canadian job market. We got a bit of a, a divergence in, in, in opinions right now in terms of what we're hearing from Mr. Miller in terms of TFWs and how they're being used and you know whether or not Canadians would fill those jobs and all that kind of stuff. We had uh, two weeks ago, or sorry, last week, we talked to the OFA. They had showed little concern because they think that, you know, they, they their understanding is that agriculture is not going to be totally hit by this, agriculture be taken care of. But this week I interviewed Lauren Martin from the Canadian Meat Council, opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, I encourage you to go to realagriculture.com and uh, listen to that interview. Very concerned about the program changes that Megan outlined in the last segment. Kelvin, what is up here? Because the mainstream media is reporting exemption, OFA did not say exemption, and clearly Canadian Meat Council that does use temporary foreign workers in their plants, their their member companies, they are concerned. What's happening here? Yeah, I think some of the differences here has to do with the the type of worker that is being brought across. I know the government has said that they don't want to uh, limit or cap seasonal peaks uh workers on on and that would be on a farm situation where you're in the field needing workers at harvest that type of thing the government has talked about exemptions or or not uh, applying the cap in those scenarios but you look at uh, a meat processing plant for example like warren represents they they employ uh, one meat plant might employ a thousand people and if 30 percent of their works workforce is temporary foreign workers and all of a sudden they have to reduce it to 20 that you've got to find 100 canadians to uh, to fill those spots in in a few weeks time that's that's where i think there's a a major pinch point here when it comes and and a disconnect too when it comes to how our food system works and and even uh, how our food supply chains and and the price of food and uh, uh, all of these things tied together Uh, government's been fighting inflation especially on the food side of things for the last number of years and here if all of a sudden we're going to uh, make our labor uh, costs skyrocket for a lot of companies that's going to translate into costs down the road somewhere as well yeah, it's funny how things change, right? 
during the pandemic. These people are heroes, right? Our, they're part of our food system. They're heroes. And now it's like, nah, we don't want you. No, nope, not good. Get out of here. Stay out. We're good. Federal budget. Uh, we are not too far away. They've been slow leaking uh, some of the programs. Not Make- leaking. Announcing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> words. Announcing, words. yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if I'd say slow either because it, it, this is a fire hose of announcements that we don't normally see before Why are they a doing federal this budget. Thing? Oh, I think it's completely strategic communications wise. They haven't been able to control the news cycle in months. And now they finally have the last couple of weeks with these announcements. Yeah. Yeah. Having been at finance previously, uh, I know the the kind of the process of unveiling a budget. And certainly when I was in Ottawa, oh gosh, it must be it's close to 10 years now. Um, yeah, it was more leaks. It was a little bit more subtle. It was uh a couple of stories in advance of the day, maybe the very same week, things you didn't want to get lost in the shuffle of the the big budget being unveiled. You know, there's 50 initiatives in the, in the book. Uh, You want to get a couple out in advance so they get their own airtime, but this is a whole different approach. This is orchestrated, planned press conferences weeks in advance. I mean, it's helpful that they are sharing the budget near the end of the fiscal year, um, you know, before they start spending money, they're they are actually telling us how they might spend it. So that's, I mean, maybe a benefit because they won't be releasing the budget until three weeks into the fiscal year. Um, but I think by the time they do release it, we should know almost everything that's in it. Though I don't know that they're going to be planning a press conference to let us know what the deficit will be. <laughs> Not ahead of time with six ministers sprawled across the country. No. No. I do wonder, like, to me, they're they're also trying to get the biggest bang for the buck here. Uh, some of these announcements are much more bark than bite. There's there's way more talk to it than there is actual substance. They require provinces, like the school food program, for example, that was announced late last week. That requires the provinces to sign on, just like some of the other uh, federal announcements that we've seen where the federal government is uh, wading into provincial uh, jurisdiction. And so if the provinces don't take that money, all of a sudden, this the federal government now can say that they've they've put the money on the table, they've announced it, but now they can point the finger at the provinces. I think that's the case with some of these. And they also have limited fiscal uh, ability here in terms of what they can actually do and what they can deploy in terms of dollar amounts. And Trudeau and the Liberals are caught in a hard place right now, uh, which I think a fair number of Canadians don't mind seeing that. But when you look at the polls and a federal election around the corner, this is time to recruit candidates. This is the time to get the party excited and get people wanting to run for you. And if you are where you are sitting, in, like they need some bump in the polls to actually recruit good candidates and get people to want to stay on for the next election. To me, they're they're in a tough spot here because they also at the same time can't go out with billions and billions more in spending, uh, looking like they're contributing further to inflation and and right. plunging further into into debt. Well, the, but this, this has been their plan: is like we're just going to announce more programming, more money, more money. Here's here, you know, here they're yeah. here to help. Well, you. It, we are here conti- to backstop your life. We're we are here. We are here. We are here. We are your friends. We are your support system. And and the government they, solves they, everything. They continue with that message: yes. like any problem out there, government is here for you. We're going to help you solve it. And and they've set this unrealistic expectation. That's why so many Canadians are frustrated because they haven't met the expectation that was set. The government look at uh, the child car, child care legacy project, ten dollar a day daycare across the country. Uh, there's new stats from Stats Canada that show the number of daycare spots in Canada is actually down. The number of kids that don't have a spot in daycare is up since that announcement was made back in 2019, 2020, I forget when it was first announced. It's like some of these big legacy things that the Trudeau government has tried to implement, big ideas that a lot of people have agreed with the idea and concept, but the execution hasn't been there. And now expectations have not been met. And and yet they continue with this theme of uh, government will uh, will help and we're, we're here to uh, protect you and save you, that kind of thing. And regardless of jurisdiction, yeah, and that too, exactly. Yeah, and, and, they and Megan, help all, solve all problems, even the yeah. municipal and provincial ones. Yeah, and, and wasn't the like when you think about a bump in the polls and all the concern about affordability, there is another decision here, and they took a pass on it, which was, you know what, Canadians, we've heard you, 
We have a big time issue with affordability. We're going to pause on raising the carbon tax on April 1st. That, that was an option. And they chose not to do it. Yeah. There's, it's interesting. It, it's sometimes it feels as though they're throwing things at the wall just to see what might stick. But their different policy initiatives are actually competing with one another in a way. I mean, we just talked about um, TFWs and losing them and the impact that might have on costs. And at the same time, they're harping on grocers to lower the costs of food at grocery stores. It's like there's like too many ministers in the mix and they're not talking to one another. Right. We are hearing from Minister Fraser um, the challenges around housing. Uh, then we're hearing from Minister Miller clamping down on TFWs and international students because apparently they're competing for housing, which I'm not sure is completely like completely accurate. Um, but it does feel like, yeah, they're doing a lot of things, trying to, what I can only imagine is trying to take some media attention away from the leader of the opposition. Uh, their actual narrative sounds weirdly familiar in that it's a lot of the things that Pierre Polyev has been talking about lately. A lot of, you know, their whole narrative has now suddenly become about affordability. Um, but I think you raise a good point, Sean, they're, you know, they're saying one thing at one side of their mouth and they're saying another thing out of the other side of their mouth, trying to do so many things. And sometimes those policy initiatives don't quite work well together. Well, you know, one of the things was their strength is the ability to cut such a wide political swath, you know, to, you know, defend the left flank, defend the right flank. Right. And it, it's hit a point where it's kind of catching up with them. Right, because you, you can't be everything to everybody, <laughs> and 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 they're, and they're kind of they're really really. But they're, they're still promising that the, know, the government can be. They don't know any different because it's what they've yeah. been doing. It's it's, <laughs> yeah. it's it's being Captain Feel Good, right? I'm yeah. just gonna you know here here's some like, I'm just gonna make you feel good about, about, about you know budgets. But you know, there's cheap shots here, like you know budgets balance themselves and all that. But this is really really hard. And it, it works in the short to medium term, in the long term, and they've been in government long term now. It it catches up with you, and that's why we're we're seeing ministers and the prime minister himself criti criticize policies that their own government has implemented well, when it comes to immigration and things like that. Yeah, and and there's a lot of talk right now in the U.S. about you know binomics not working. Their situation looks a heck of a lot better than ours does right now, and it's it's all in there. They have a left side of the aisle government too. So, you know, there's, there is, I think, a lot of, uh, there's some targets right now on, on the prime minister. Okay, on, to, before we take a break on the budget, is there anything from an agricultural perspective we are expecting from this budget that we need to be paying attention to from either of you? Okay. I don't know if I, yeah, I, I, I think we're going to probably see, like we've, we've been seeing some cuts and we've, we've talked, we've talked about the 4-H reduction in funding there. That's, a, that's not in this year's budget going forward necessarily that or yeah it is but it but it took effect last year already uh i think we're going to still see some more more trimming of uh spending in around the around the corners in some areas and in some places it won't feel like it's just around the corners it's going to feel like it's uh, it's taking things out like we've we've seen certain programs of this soy canada has raised issues with soy research in southern ontario and other places where where spending is is they're trying to find savings and it might not be in places that farmers and farm groups want to see. Yeah, we're looking for answers. Well, mm -hmm. speaking of answers, for every acre you work, Coke Agronomic Services has an answer to help. From nitrogen protection to micronutrients and seed enhancers, discover a portfolio of solutions designed to solve the problems you face. Find your answers at cokeag.ca. we got a lot more to talk about here on the Real Ag Issues panel. Kelvin Hefner, Sean Haney, Megan Murdoch, and we'll be right back right after this. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. Get all the information you need to keep your pulse crop healthy and profitable with the Pulse School on realagriculture.com. The Pulse School is a free YouTube video series covering agronomy, research, and more across a host of different pulse crops. 
It's also available as an audio podcast wherever you download or stream your favorite podcast. Check us out on YouTube or visit realagriculture.com, The Pulse School, brought to you by BSF Canada. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio. Next thing you know, you know the next thing. Next is Now is a short podcast discussing agriculture's emerging next generation tech and trends as they're happening in the industry. Next is Now presented by GFL Ag. Listen where you get your podcasts today. Sean Haney, Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture, as well as Megan Murdoch of Hill and Knowlton. Okay, now we've covered the budget. We've talked about uh, the jobs numbers, what's happening in the economy. A very specific agricultural issue, Kelvin, that is very much in the news has everybody on their toes, I think, right now, is what is happening as it relates to dairy animals in the U.S. and avian influenza. And this is a quickly evolving situation. What we talked about last week, where we've come a, quite a long ways, in actual fact, um, the, uh, this just feels like it's going to get worse before it gets better. Very concerning. Yeah, a lot of concerning developments on the on this uh, in the last week here since we last talked about it. Uh, last week, of course, USDA confirmed for the first time HPAI, highly pathogenic avian influenza, the same disease that's been tearing through uh, wild bird populations and also domesticated poultry over the last couple of years here in North America, was confirmed in dairy cows for the first time in Texas and Kansas. And now there's a whole bunch of other states that are on the list as well, Michigan, Ohio, Idaho, uh, or some that uh, New Mexico, I believe, also as well. And so they're finding more cases of this uh, virus affecting dairy cattle. So far, it hasn't been uh, confirmed that I have heard in uh, in beef cattle. But, but one reason might be that dairy cattle are, of course, most of them are handled daily. And, and a lot of different things are measured when it comes to their performance on a daily basis. That isn't always the case with uh, the same same with uh, with beef herds in a feedlot, for example. But uh uh, yeah, it's it is concerning that this virus has shown the ability now to establish itself in a in a different type, totally different category of animal, a ruminant, of course, and uh, and so uh, this there's also some signs that certain there there's been a couple mutations that scientists have confirmed on this virus, and so it's something to watch. And certainly, biosecurity is important. It would have it would be really great if this disease would just run its course in the wild bird population before the virus jumps to a different type of species and we're starting to see signs that it has is moving into cattle it's not causing high mortality or anything like that it's mainly decreased milk production and Lindsay has written an article it's up on real agriculture uh with a lot more detail as to what this actually looks like in dairy cattle in terms of the symptoms and what uh, the vets have been seeing because they're now thinking that it's probably been around for months in uh, especially in the southern u.s in in dairy herds it was kind of this mysterious disease causing decreased milk production decreased feed intake basically the cows seeming depressed and uh, and now they're linking it to uh, HPAI, and so there is uh, starting to be a, a good, I, I think, uh, definition or description of of what this disease looks like and how it plays out in a herd. Megan, as a communicate as a communicator, um, you put yourself in the seat of some of the organizations that represent not only the dairy industry but also the beef industry in, in the U.S. and in Canada. The the key message here is trying to drive home. Based on what the science says, no threat to the food safety and yeah. and and yeah. food safety for consumers. That that's really the point that has to be driven continually. A hundred percent. Yeah, that that has to be everyone's. And you know, real agriculture can help with that. Like just reiterating at all times that there's no impact on the the safety of the milk and certainly pasteurized product. Um, that that's not an issue here at all. And you know, the industry has to be concerned about trade, um, trade stoppages as well, with other countries being concerned about transmission in that way. Um, all very dangerous uh, outcomes uh, when those, you know, when fear starts to escalate um, for an industry like this. Uh, I was in New Zealand when it uh, experienced its first um, outbreak of mycoplasma bovis, uh, devastating really for a country that uh, for all intents and purposes has really been able to manage their biosecurity, uh, helpful to be an island in the South Pacific. Um, but that was a, a major outbreak 
very, very concerning from a, you know, a consumer perspective and a trade perspective. Um, they were able to quickly manage it, but communications was a massive, massive orchestrated uh, part of that. Um, and I think the shape of the industry there, and I think this, this will be interesting in Canada in our supply managed industry as to how we can actually control um, not only from an operational and biosecurity point of view, but how we can actually control the messaging as well, because uh, the industry is so connected. Uh, in New Zealand, for instance, the largest producer there that I was fortunate to work with it was Fonterra. They have about 80% of the dairy. So they were able to largely control all the communications, all the testing programs, and lock it down very quickly because they had the control um, over the industry in order to make that happen. So I'm curious to hear, you know, Kelvin's point of view on this, like how our industry differs from the American industry and how that might help prevent um, not only the spread, but also control the communication. Uh, I know we have a lot of cooks in the kitchen still, um, but curious to hear what your, your thoughts are on that. I think that's a good point. I, I do think that uh, there will the Canadian dairy industry by its nature is also more connected in terms of tracking animals and, and some of the traceability that happens on farms. So I think in terms of uh, sick animals moving around, there might be uh, already implemented mechanisms that aren't as common or as in-depth in, in the U.S. But at the same time, yeah, it's, it's still the same challenge and we still have the same virus. Uh, wild birds are migrating right now. There's geese all over the place and uh, it, uh, that viral load is out there. And so I, I don't know whether we should bank on having anything in mm -hmm. Canada that will prevent it from having the same situation as what the U.S. has. And, and so mm -hmm. the message, I think, is going to have to be the same in terms of uh, pasteurized milk is still safe. And, and if it gets into the beef herd as well, there's going to have to be some major messaging uh, around that as well. And that's one thing that I, uh, this is kind of changing topic or going off on a rabbit trail here, but we've seen cattle markets actually weaken here this last week. And, and that kind of confused me because I'm like, well, if, if anything, this is going to impact supply. Like if we're gonna, if it's going to hamper milk production in in a beef herd, for example, it'll it'll hurt uh, weight gain and all, all all those types of performance things as well. So, but I guess on the demand side of things, that's where the market is seeing concern. And of course, that comes down to communications and helping people understand that uh, this isn't about uh, about spreading anything in uh, in yeah. our our food. And if you've been listening to the beef market update for the past 12 months this is not an industry that can afford the consumer to back away from buying beef based on the supply that we have coming coming through the channel now i i got a statement from the national cattle feeders association they say they've been actively watching the progression of this disease in the u.s dairy herd at this time we have been assured there is no immediate concern for canadian beef production but we'll continue to monitor developments and we're in constant communication with the canadian food inspection agency and yeah. our industry colleagues. Now, what we have seen in the U.S., Kelvin, is I believe Nebraska was one of the states. There's a, 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 a few others that have restricted movement of cattle. I think specifically dairy cattle at this point, yes. right? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, sorry. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so they're tr I, and I think that is kind of that, that immediate reaction is to shut things down. Let's get a handle of the situation before we spread this disease any further. We saw that, for example, in the early days of COVID as well, when it, we were all, uh, when lockdowns happened and that type of thing. So uh, there is, yeah, I, I don't know whether that will prove to be an overreaction in, in the long term, but right now some states have have stopped that. And Megan mentioned trade implica potential trade implications of that. That can be inter in inside of a country as well between states or provinces. Yeah, we got interprovincial barriers already on stuff. Um, Now, because my, I want to jump ahead, but there is when it comes to restrictions of movement of cattle because of the integrated nature of say the beef system that is bad people bad and like dairy, dairy and beef are not as separate as what they are not most people think because of how many dairy cows end up in the beef supply chain as well so you've got dairy dairy animals uh, that are going to the same plants as beef. Yeah, but I think it does go office. back to the the symptoms. Like with with um, Mbovis, it was really milk limiting. It was really, you know, an impact on dairy. It, you know, it wasn't pleasant for the cow. Um, uh, you know, and then they did call call it out essentially of the system. Um, but really, you know, I'd I'd be curious what the true impact is on the beef beef cow. It could be 
really practically no real impact, right? Uh, well, one of the things Lindsay, uh, yeah. so Lindsay, again, Lindsay has this article talking about the effects and one of the things that they're just learning now because of understanding what and, and how long it's been around now in some of these southern states, they're, they're trying to figure out how much this impacts reproductive mm -hmm. uh, capabilities as the cow cycles back. And there's some thought that there could potentially be impact there, which if that happens in the beef herd, that could be uh, that could could have some impact. Yeah, or 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 production, like from a from a yeah, or weight gain, being knocked, still being, being knocked off feed for two weeks. Yeah, if you're not eating for fourteen days, you're not gaining weight for. 14 yeah, and days. how long will it cycle through the herd? Is I guess the question, right? Yeah. Well, if if we look, I, I, and again, I'm speculating here, but I have I, I'm using the ASF example where USDA and CFIA were like very much in like Operation North America, <laughs> you know, and I I have to imagine. In this situation, it would be similar working together. I I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm totally. We did I that with BSC, right? Like, there's an ability to actually lock down parts of the country within Canada, yeah. right? There's actually like there's protocol uh, to lock down the west, lock down the east. You know, however it might be, it does. I hope it we don't get a lot there. of sense. We do have yeah, to operate sure. as a North American unit in this instance. It's there's just no way around it. Yeah, we I, have I, we have connected with CFIA uh, this week just to, again, confirm that it hasn't been found in Canada. And in their messaging, they have continually said they're in touch with U.S. authorities, USDA, and others on this as well. So I do think, like you said, Sean, that there is there are channels for constant communication there. Yeah, and, absolutely. And certainly we'd want to be treated uh, in the same instance if the situation was reversed, right? Yes. So we have to be really careful about how we, uh -huh. we work with the U.S. in this instance, because if the rules were reversed, we'd, we'd want the same treatment. This is my point last week. I, I I need to keep track of these things, Kelvin. <laughs> you thought I was being maybe ridiculous. He, he he said I was being hyperbolic. I think was the word that he used, or something like that. I was being ridiculous. Is that what you said? Uh, we're bringing. We, you want to relive this? <laughs> it, was, okay. it almost got to the point of being awkward, Megan, because I called Sean out on what I, I think I called it an artificial argument. I mean, <laughs> like a straw man argument is what I was trying to say. <laughs> I think you were making accusations that that I uh, I, I did not make an deserved. accusation. I gave a scenario I <laughs> hope we would avoid. Uh, anyway, it's good fun. We can't okay. move on apparently. Uh, we, we're we're going to move on. We're going to take a break, <laughs> and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the data that we have seen from real agri studies in relation to how farmers feel about free trade. There are some things that we would expect. And there's a few surprises where I want to get feedback from the panel on they can maybe tell me a bit of a why. You're listening to Real Life Radio, Rural Radio, 147, Sirius XM. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of The Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on The Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by BASF and Syngenta Canada. Peter Johnson at WheatPeatRealAgriculture.com and what an opportunity! Oh my gosh! You think you can't grow better wheat? You are absolutely wrong. We're going to show you how to strive for those record wheat yields that they get in the UK and in New Zealand. You can grow 150 bushel wheat. I'll show you how. Catch Wheat Beats Word every Wednesday on RealAgriculture.com or download the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio for the Real Ag Issues panel. Sean Haney, Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture, as well as Megan Murdoch of Hill and Knowlton. Cattle markets are destined to rise and fall, and that's a sure thing. Make sure you're protected from unexpected price drops with livestock price insurance. Price protection for calves is available now through June 13th. For more information, visit lpi.ca. That's lpi.ca. Okay, this week, uh, well, actually yesterday, posted a, a, a column diving into how farmers in Canada feel about free trade agreements and market access. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this, where we said that 52% of Canadian farmers of all types see free trade and market access as a, as a positive to some degree on the, on the farming operations. I want to dig more into that because the 52% to me felt low. We know this. We know that dairy farmers see trade free trade agreements as a negative. 
beef farmers, for example, see it as a positive. One of the surprising things in all of this, Kelvin, is the fact the largest farms, farms over five million in revenue, were the least positive of all the other farm sizes when it comes to free trade. That to me was one that stuck out like a sore thumb. Can you please tell me why? <laughs> I don't know if I have a really good answer. I maybe have some theories, but I don't know if any of them really hold up. I originally I, I asked you how many, what percentage of those five million and over self-reported income farms were dairy, because certainly if there was a correlation between the dairy sector and those large farms in, in our survey, that that might be a reason why. But dairy wasn't that significant to uh, to be the reason for why the the large farms in this when we, when we break it down by income uh, said that they were less favor in favor of trade. One, I guess, one other idea might be that large farms might do more value add or more have a direct connection with processors that add value, and maybe they feel safer in terms of their ability to to market and and have more confidence. I, but that I don't know if that holds up either. That I'm really scratching here in terms of trying to come up with ideas. Maybe Megan has some, or I don't know, Sean, have you thought about it some more? I, I've talked to a lot of people, and there are there's not a lot of answers. What what I what I've got back from a lot of people is an over overall reaction to the lack of excitement, of, you know, in in that positive impact is that we haven't had a lot of trade disruption, and so it's it may be there may be a disconnect to the value because stuff just gets delivered, and it's off farm, and it 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 the system happens right that that. We but that's an overall comment, yeah. not necessarily specific to the largest farms. Yeah, and that's we like to make fun of uh, people who go to the grocery store and think their food is, all just comes from the grocery store. But sometimes on the farmer side of things, we might be guilty of the same thing yeah. in, in terms of we bring it to the elevator or, or deliver it to the, the plant and Me it just it just goes away from there. Meg, I'm going to throw another one to you, okay? And this one, not as like off the wall, but when we look at the negative reaction or negative impact versus positive impact the younger you are the more positive you are about free trade and market access the and, and as you get older you you definitely become you're you're still positive but you're less positive what, why would age have an impact on how you feel about trade yeah that's a really interesting question and to calvin's good point i'm not sure that i have exactly the answer but some hypotheses maybe um you know, certainly during COVID, we saw massive disruption of the supply chains around the world. To, you know, it's still probably working its way through. Um, and there was a real reversion to onshoring, right? Control your own supply chain, control your own access. Don't worry about the rest of the world. Um, protect yourselves first. A bit of a, you know, protectionist nature. Don't know that that's fully left. Um, but I do wonder if that is a little bit more top of mind for an older generation that may be more risk adverse. Um, and yeah, and maybe more, a bit more protectionist about, you know, work their whole lives have, you know, produced great food. They're not, uh, they don't need to overreach. Um, but maybe, you know, they just, they want confidence and stability in the system and and maybe that international trade and how disruptive it can be is not particularly appealing it's a spectrum of you know if you're the most negative you're not minus two and if you're the most positive you're plus two so but that's basically the band and zero is neutral okay so I, i'm not really sure if it impacts me positively or negatively what did surprise me and i kind of alluded to this already beef was a positive 0.32 so that's that's you know i, I feel somewhat positive about free trade Dairy, minus 47. I feel somewhat negative about free trade, but not a lot in either direction. I actually thought, I, I'm not surprised which sides of the positive and negative those two are. I thought they would be more extreme. And, and one is, you know, we've heard a lot from the dairy industry about how free trade has hurt them. In fact, the government has given millions of dollars in programming to to basically say, we're sorry we had to give up market access. You know, here's some money. The, and, and there's that because they were so negatively impacted. 
on the on the beef side, everybody can just think back to BSC in 2003. We, we I still hear about it from the cow calf sector as one of the reasons people haven't expanded. We talk about it all the time in the feeding industry. The the hangover is is still living here. I think today. it happened yesterday. Yeah, like it happened yesterday. <laughs> Yet we're only like slightly positive about the benefits in, in terms of the positive impact of of, of trade. I, I thought those extremes would be bigger. One of my takeaways here too is. I, my opinion, there is obviously a disconnect between what the what the benefits have been for Canadian agriculture when it comes to trade, and I think it's a clear messaging to industry groups, spe specifically the exportable commodities, CAFTA, the organization that represents all those. They need to step up their communication when it comes mm -hmm. to closing the gap on what the value is versus what the perceptions are, because there's a gap here. It, Megan, is that? Yeah, yeah, and I I do wonder about the gap around communication and, you know, reiterating what that value of trade is, um, we might just take it for granted and, you know, um, not always see it. And I think your point on there not being a ton of disruption in recent years uh, could play part of that. Um, I do wonder how much communication uh, current governments um, are putting on trade. Yep. Past governments certainly uh, were very, very trade focused. Every couple of weeks, you'd hear about a new trade mission, a new deal being signed, something you know happening in that that sphere. I think the focus is has changed. It's around housing. It's around affordability. Perhaps we're feeling that on farm, and and trade's just less of a priority. Which is maybe why our economy is sort of like sputtering because we're not actually paying it. We're not actually talking about the thing that really, really drives our is our economic engine. It's mm -hmm. it's small business, and it's 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 trade. We're an export reliant country. Kelvin, you get the final word here. <laughs> no, I, I I will just underscore what you're all saying. There's globally, there's a move away from globalization. There's been this French shoring discussion. There's uh, more protectionism. We've talked about this at length too over in the last few months. In terms of a lot of countries, populist governments, politicians, so many countries going to the polls this year. Of, there's just a lot of protectionist messaging happening, and it's we're not uh, immune to it in in Canada either. And so I don't know. I I, I do wonder whether some of the uh, concern or some of the less favorable views than we expect on trade might just be from experience, lived experience, and challenges living through BSE and all the borders closing and mm -hmm. realizing that uh, yeah, sure, it's. We are reliant on that trade, but it sure sucks when uh, when when it doesn't work, and it's it, and that volatility is brought into the the market and into our our farm's future, that type of thing. So, I don't know. I I wonder whether some of this just correlates with people's lived experience going back to the seventies and when well, fair fair when, when trade was less predictable and rules based than what it has been the last twenty years. You know what would really suck, Kelvin, not having it at all. Oh, that's exactly. what, that's well, what yeah. would really suck. So, yeah. well, but trade but agreements people... don't matter if you can't get your grain to port. So, I mean, let's talk about <laughs> the railways. Do we have time well, for that? Well, we, we got to pause. That, that's next week. They're, and railways are underperforming, by the way. Uh, that's yeah. that, that, Some well, concerning data coming, coming out the last few weeks. Yeah. Tell me, you, if you can tell me why, I have no idea. Okay, uh, if you have any feedback, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. The Real Ag feedback line is also 855-776-6147. Megan, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Have yourself a great weekend. Thanks for having me. Talk soon. <laughs> That is Megan Murdoch of Hill and Knowlton. And Kelvin, have fun at that spring hockey tournament, man. Light up Regina. Yeah, we'll enjoy some Regina hospitality here and uh, and enjoy the last of uh, hockey season before we get to the field. And also go Blue Jays as they return home. Hopefully they can score some runs. That is an up and down affair. You want to talk about volatile markets. Their their offense is up. <laughs> That's, that, that requires a whole hour of a show. Okay, thanks so much, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Life Radio. Chat again next week. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this Real Life Radio podcast brought to you by High Performing Carbine Insecticide from FMC. Carbine Insecticide hits aphids hard with effective, selective, extended control. It also has activity on ligus and tarnished plant bugs. Ask your retailer today.